Kira, we're live. We're live on Facebook this morning as well as Zoom. So welcome to all of you who are on Zoom and welcome to folks who are on Facebook. Uh, today's the 24th Sunday after Pentecost. We're quickly coming up to the end of the liturgical year and getting ready for Advent. So uh, today our main gospel story is the parable I'm on Facebook of the this morning as well as Zoom. So welcome to all of you who are on Zoom. I don't know if you're getting the recording as well as I am, so it's very interesting. Anyway, uh, we'll begin now with the prelude. We begin our service with the opening hymn, O God, our help in ages past. As always, remember that you are all muted, so you can sing as loudly and um, boisterously if, as you would like, and Maddie is our song leader.
blessed be the one holy and living God. And blessed be God's kingdom now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Together we say, glory to God in the highest and peace to God's people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you and also with you. Let us pray. Blessed Lord, who caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, Grant us so to hear them, mark, read, learn, and inwardly digest them, that we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. The first lesson is from the book of Zephaniah. Be silent before the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is at hand. The Lord has prepared a sacrifice. He has consecrated his guests. At that time, I will search Jerusalem with lamps, and I will punish the people who rest complacently on their dregs. Those who say in their hearts, the Lord will not do good, nor will he do harm. Their wealth shall be plundered and their houses laid waste. Though they build houses, they shall not inhabit them. Though they plant vineyards, they shall not drink wine from them. The great day of the Lord is near, near and hastening fast. The sound of the day of the Lord is bitter. The warrior cries aloud there. That day will be a day of wrath, a day of distress and anguish, a day of ruin and devastation a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of trumpet blast and battle cry against the fortified cities and against the lofty battlements. I will bring such distress upon the people that they shall walk like the blind because they have sinned against the Lord. Their blood shall be poured out like dust and their flesh like dung. Neither their silver nor their gold will be able to save them on the day of the Lord's wrath and the fire of his passion, the whole earth shall be consumed for a full, a terrible end. He will make all of the inhabitants of the earth. He will make all of the inhabitants of the earth. The word of the Lord. John, could you go ahead and lead the psalm? Oh, okay. I didn't know. No, that's Lord, great. 
you have been our refuge from one generation to another. Before the mountains were brought forth, or the land and the earth were born, from the age to age you are God. You turn us back to the dust and say, Go back, O child of earth, for a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it is past, and like a watch in the night. You sweep us away like a dream. We fade away suddenly like the grass. In the morning it is green and flourishes. In the evening it is dried up and withered. For we consume away in your displeasure. We are afraid because of your wrathful indignation. Our iniquities you have set before you and our secret sins in the light of your countenance. So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. The second reading is from the is from First Thessalonians. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers and sisters, you do not need to have anything written to you, for you yourselves know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. When they say there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them, as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and there will be no escape. But you, beloved, are not in darkness, for that day to surprise you like a thief, for you are all children of light and children of the day. We are not of the night or of darkness. So then let us not fall asleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep at night and those who are drunk get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, oh, but since he has destined us not for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus. I'm sorry. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober and put on the breastplate of faith and love and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has destined us not for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live with him. Therefore, encourage one another to build up each other as indeed you are doing, the word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Jesus said, it is as if a man going on a journey summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them to one, he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. The one who had received the five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had the two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I have made five more talents. His master said to him, well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with the two talents also came forward saying, master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I have made two more talents. His master said to him, well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received the one talent also came forward saying, master, I knew that you were a harsh man reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. 
So I was afraid and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here, you have what is yours. But his master replied, you wicked and lazy slave. You knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I did not scatter? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. And on my return, I would have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one with the 10 talents. For to all those who have, more will be given and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Well, good morning again. Those of you who've been around for years and years will recognize that frequently this sermon, or excuse me, this text from Matthew is used as a stewardship sermon, um, having to do with time, talents, and treasure, and that whatever talent you have, you should go and make more of it, even as to double it. And so a stewardship sermon today, oh, might feel like good news, but for most people, a stewardship sermon doesn't feel like good news. And I have good news for you. This is not a stewardship sermon. I want us to think, uh, put ourselves back into the first century when Jesus uh, lived, and then especially in the first generation of of believers after Jesus died and was resurrected. And think for a minute about life, what life was like for those folks. First of all, back in those days, there was what was called an honor shame system. And unlike our culture, the honor shame system was paramount and infused into every aspect of life. And there was only so much honor to have, that is there was a fixed amount of honor. And so if you had more honor, that meant that somebody else had less honor. If you had shame, it was because you had a loss of honor. Honor made you superior. It meant that you could claim entitlements. It gave you power. It gave you wealth. It gave you personal loyalty, fame, reputation. Many of the things that we value in our world today were not achieved through wealth, but were achieved through honor, public honoring of a person. The opposite of that was shame, a loss of honor. And you could have negative shame, which was to lose your esteem or to be punished in some way. Remember that, that with negative shame, you could be punished. Or positive shame, which was being very aware of one's position in terms of honor and whether one needed to do more to become more honorable. So to grasp, um, and, then, and then finally, to grasp more honor than the public around you would recognize, because that's what honor is about, the public recognizing you. If you grasp more honor than the public would recognize, you would be considered a greedy thief because you're stealing something that there's only a limited amount of. Now, the other thing we need to keep in mind is what a talent was. 
you and I usually think of, and I was taught that a talent is like a gift or a skill or an ability that we each have. Back in Jesus' day, that was not the meaning of the word talent or talents. That explanation of talent as a gift or a skill only came about in the 13th century. A talent was a measure of weight for which one would measure silver or gold. And a talent was a huge, huge amount of silver or gold. So it's thought, for instance, that when the master gave the first servants, the first servant, five talents, he gave him multi millions of dollars in today's thinking. The, the master gave him an enormous amount of wealth, 20 or 30 years worth of wages. If you cut that in half, roughly, the man, the slave who had received two talents was also given an extraordinary amount of money. And the third slave who was given one, ten, one talent, he also was given an extraordinary amount of money. So the talents we're talking about here is not your personal abilities. It's, it's about money. So what we see here then in this parable is that the one slave went and took his five talents, his multi-millions of dollars, and while the master was away, he doubled it. That's a good rate of return and brought it back to the master. The second slave did the same thing. He took the two talents, still an incredible amount of money, doubled it, brought it back to the slave, to the master. They're both commended for what they have done. The third slave is two things. One, he recognizes that the master does not earn anything that the slave does in terms of um, making more money. He reaps where he does not sow. He gathers where he has not scattered. The, that slave is aware that the master himself doesn't do much to increase his wealth. And in fact, going back to the first and second slaves, it was probably the case, well, we can ask, how did they double their money? And it's been said by those who study such things that probably the way they doubled that money was through things like extortion, bribery, um, even taking what doesn't belong to them, other sorts of things that are born, the cost of which is born on the backs of the poor. Okay. So the third a slave, as I said, um, recognizes the master for who he is, that is someone who counts on other people to make the money for him. And he also obeys the command not to charge interest for loaning and lending and borrowing, which was a command in the Old Testament. So that may be why he was reluctant to put the money into the bank, as the master said he should have. Instead, he goes out into a field and he buries the money. Another interesting fact is in Jesus' time, if you went out and had some sort of treasure, maybe a pearl of great price or something like that, and you buried it in a field and left it there, then you were not responsible if somebody else came and dug it up and took it. It was not your fault. So the third slave, in a sense, protected himself by going and burying the money. But he knew where it was, and presumably nobody else did. 
So the chances of that talent being there when he got back were significant. Now, when we usually read this story, we think those first two slaves, what great folks they are. They've taken what money there was and they doubled it. Those of us who are Western capitalists or who live in that system as we do, we look at this parable and we think, okay, this is the way to go. Go out, try and double your money, make whatever return on it as you can, and God will be pleased. Don't do that, and your master will not be pleased. Some people have called this the homespun capitalism on the lips of Jesus. Um, that the heroes of this story with that mindset are the two first slaves. But we might ask, how would a peasant in Jesus' time look at this story? How would the people who are gathering around Jesus hear this story? How would people who don't have access to all these talents, how would they hear the story? And we might call this flipping the script. So for a peasant, what was honorable was to maintain what you had, to not seek either loss or wealth. In the same way that honor was limited and there was only so much of it, wealth also was limited and there's only so much of it. So what you have of it, you keep, don't necessarily give it away, but you don't try and get more because that means you're taking it away from somebody else. In a sense, that's what the third slave did, right? He went and took the talent and buried it. It was not an attempt to get more from at the expense of somebody else, and yet he also wasn't given it away. So from the peasant point of view, the masters and the first two slaves are not heroes, but they're villains. They are villains because they make wealth on the backs of people like peasants and they're not acting therefore in an honorable way. The third slave refused to participate in the system knowing that the rich will always take care of themselves as they did in this case. So this is a story that appears to us to go one way, but looking through the eyes of the other side really is telling us something more. That maybe we should be on the side of the peasant because the master and the two slaves um, are exploiting, are exploiting people, exploiting them so much that the master can exact a punishment on his slave when he talks about being thrown into the utter darkness and into the fire. He's probably talking about one of the trash heaps that would have been around the city. But this story um, from the peasant point of view uh, is, is told against the master and the first two slaves. But what would that have to do with us? So let's flip the script another time and think about Jesus. What could this have to do with Jesus? The first thing we need to do is disconnect the idea that the master is God. Our minds usually flip to whenever there's a householder or a master or an overseer, we think that must be God. But we're not told that. We're just told that there's a master. So try and separate the idea of God from 
the character of the master. And then we need to think about when does Jesus tell this story? Well, he tells it in the days before his uh, crucifixion, in the days when he's in intense uh, debate and tension between the religious leaders, the Pharisees and the scribes and the elders and the Roman officials. You might remember that in the past several Sundays, there's always been a conflict between Jesus and the authorities. So Jesus is telling this story um, in some sense against those who have wealth and authority and honor. And he's also perhaps giving us a prediction or a foreshadowing of what will happen to him. You might remember that last week we talked about how it's not enough to be ready to be ready. It's not enough to get ready to get ready, but that Jesus calls us to get ready for when his return comes, to stay awake and stay alert. In this case, he is continuing that theme, but also we need to remember that Jesus is going to be crucified by those who are seen to be with honor in the system, and he's going to be treated as a criminal and as the poor and as one who is of no account. So some have suggested that a foreshadowing of Jesus here is that that third slave buried the treasure. Who gets buried in a very short while in this gospel? Jesus gets buried. Jesus gets buried. Jesus gets buried and forgotten about um, or, or uh, considered done with and gone. It's almost as if he is lost because he has been crucified. Jesus, we might say, is buried out in a field where no one will find him. But then what happens? He is raised out of death. We might think about that talent as being raised out of the ground. Jesus is raised out of the tomb and comes to life again. Jesus is brought back to life and given back to us. We might say that Jesus was telling a story that was good news for the poor, that was good news for those who were without hope, good news, good news for those who are usually shamed. It was good news to hear that what, what's, who some people would consider to be the least is really the most honorable. And so the script has flipped. Those who would have received the most honor, the first, the master and the first two slaves, in God's eyes, are really shamed. And the one who is shamed is the one who ought to be honored. And isn't that what we celebrate with Christ? He who was shamed is now of honor. So what does that have to do with us? We say we know somewhat what this had to do with the peasants of first century Palestine and what it might have had to do with Jesus, how we can imagine Jesus in the story, but what does it say to us? Well, I think we can first of all just look at, at those um, uh, characteristics of shame, of poorness, of uh, uh, lack of uh, esteem, and say that 
those are the folks who Jesus particularly cares about. That God and Jesus, as we're reading in the book, uh, Sacred, or um, Jesus and the Disinherited in the Sacred Ground program, that Jesus is the one who stands with those who are against the wall. Those folks who are mistreated, victims of injustice, as I said, poor, um, without power, without esteem. But also in these days of COVID, many of us are afraid. Some of us are getting more afraid because of the rising numbers of uh, cases that are here in Michigan and in the United States and all over the world. We're afraid. Some of us do feel shame uh, because of our family upbringings, because of the family systems we have been born into, because of the values that other people have that we can't possibly attain to. Some of us are poor. Some of us are like that, that third slave who are afraid of God, who, are, who walk through life afraid. For many of us, we are the peasant. What, we, what I encourage us to understand is the bigger message of the scripture and even uh, quoted in our verse from Thessalonians. God has destined us for salvation. And God has not destined us for salvation after we have been punished, after God has exacted from us uh, some sort of punishment or banishment or um, loss of the honor of being a child of God. Rather, God has destined us all for salvation. Jesus died for the sins of the whole world, not for just some. Jesus and God look at each of us as beloved children, individually and as a whole human race. God does not judge our character or our worthiness by what our talents are, either in terms of our skills and abilities or based on how much money we have. God values us and loves us because we are made in that divine image. And God's desire for us and for God is to be in continual communion with us. So as we go about these days and as COVID pandemic might be causing us to hunker down even more, or if we find ourselves slipping a little bit into despair, if we find it very difficult to be in these times, and if all these other potential conditions uh, impact us, know that the least of those the third slave, the peasant, is not only the people that Jesus came to save particularly, but also who Jesus came to be amongst and with eternally. So that's the good news of this parable. It's not a stewardship sermon. It's a reassurance of doing the right thing and being vindicated by God in the end, which we all will be. Amen. I invite you now to join with me as we affirm the faith of the church in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. 
We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made a man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. In peace, we pray to you, Lord God. for all people in their daily life and work, for our families, friends, and neighbors, and for those who are alone. For this community, the nation, and the world, and for all who work for justice, freedom, and peace. For the just and proper use of your creation, for the victims of hunger, fear, injustice and oppression. For all who are in danger, sorrow or any kind of trouble, for those who minister to the sick, the friendless and the needy. For the peace and unity of the church of God, for all who proclaim the gospel and all who seek the truth. For Michael, our presiding bishop, and for Bonnie, our bishop, and for all bishops and other ministers, for all who serve God in the church, for the special needs and concerns of this congregation. Pray for Louise and David French who have lost their nephew this past week. Pray for all those who are stricken with COVID-19. For those who have tested positive. For those who are quarantining. And for all the variety of healthcare workers who tend to them. I pray for my father. Hear us, Lord, for your mercy is great. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life. We give thanks for the St. James congregation, for our families, for our friends, for our neighbors. For those who are the helpers. I give thanks for my family. We will exalt you, O God, our King, and praise your name forever and ever. We pray for all who have died, that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. 
especially praying for the repose of the soul of Kevin Jones. For my mother, my grandparents, my aunts and uncles. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them who put their trust in you. We pray to you also for the forgiveness of our sins. Have mercy upon us, most merciful God. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things done and left undone. And so uphold us by your spirit that we may live and serve you in newness of life to the honor and glory of your name through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. We sum up all the, our prayers together as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Well, good morning again. Uh, Kevin, I think we can unmute everybody for a moment. Um, at the same time asking that as you're unmuted, um, be aware. Carol, you muted yourself. I didn't mean to do that. There we go. So did, did the part already come where I'm asking people to unmute themselves? You can yes. unmute yourself now. Okay. Um, because this is the time that uh, we're gonna have announcements and some of you have, may have announcements and we're also uh, using this time because we're emphasizing okay. gratitude and appreciation in this season uh, where you could offer uh, for everyone one of your gratitudes or thanksgivings. But first of all, let me uh, do some announcements for you. Um, Louise, I think I messed it up again. Your nephew who passed away was Kevin Jones. 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 Right. So, so I got it wrong in, the, in my bulletin. Hopefully I fixed it in the uh, later in the PowerPoint. Um, I see that Julie Lowry is here. Julie, do you want to explain the uh, announcement about the photographs? Um, uh, yeah, just to repeat that, um, uh, we, it's still up, up until mm, maybe midweek this week, accept any photographs that, so you, cute. that you have um, of God's creation for which you're very grateful. And how many photos do you think you have so far, roughly? Um, I would say 20. Okay. So you could submit one or two photographs of um, that you've taken of God's creation and um, we'll have a slideshow for them next week. Jackie, do you want to give the announcement about uh, the Christmas giving that we do? 
Sure. Well, first, I'm very thankful that um, we've completed our uh, seasonings for the season bags. Uh, we actually had 11 that uh, between Grace and Janet Cook, we took over to FIA. So yay for us. Um, and now we're uh, working on our bags of grace. Um, and I think you all received an email talking about that. And um, so we're asking that if you would like to shop, which would mean either in person or online, we have gifts that uh, center from a four-year-old up through a 64-year-old. So there's a couple of toys, there's a lot of bedding, um, there's some clothing, or if it's easier for you, you can just make a donation to the church and uh, my group of merry men and I will go out and do the shopping or online shopping uh, on your behalf. And um, we are really happy to do that. Um, you know, we debated on whether or not to try and attempt this this year because it is more difficult for me to whip you guys into a frenzy when I'm not <laughs> in person with you. Um, but we knew deep down that the need this year is greater than it has been. So um, if you'd like to do your own shopping, please let me know by Wednesday and I'll assign you the names and the labels. Um, if you want to donate money, you can do that for the next three weeks and uh, that would help us out too. Um, so we have to be done with this project by December 14th. So I appreciate all of you helping us with that. Okay. And in the bulletin that you received by email, um, it gives you uh, the written version of what Jackie just said so you can remember the dates. Okay. Are there announcements that, um, let me just double check, announcements that weren't printed either in the bulletin or I don't know of them because I didn't print them in the bulletin. Alice? Yes, just a reminder. Um, Choir, you should by now have received your Zoom invitation for our um, next rehearsal, which is Wednesday night, and uh, we'll be starting Christmas music. So make sure to tune in at seven o'clock. Okay, wonderful. So, some of us aren't getting the bulletin. Uh, did you get, oh. but you got the Zoom link, correct? Well, I went back to October 8th, and that's the only way I got in was the old link. Okay. Um, so you can stay on after this meeting. Um, uh, check your spam mail, though. Some people have been having trouble with. Okay, so we'll have to check and see what that issue is. Because you should get a new Zoom link with the bulletin every week. Emily, were you going to say something? Yeah, something else that helps with that is to put that email address into your contacts. Okay. It comes in, it recognizes it, it, it knows it's something that it knows. So it doesn't try to put it into spam. It'll put it into your regular, you know, okay. your regular inbox. Okay, thanks, Emily. Yeah, but, and you might want to reply to that email, the one that you have from October, Shannon. Okay. Check, there might be a, a disconnect in how your uh, email is spelled, right? So that might be the, that might be the situation too. Okay. okay. I would respond back to that and, um, Carol, maybe we could do a little testing or Julie uh, to Shannon's email address from that inbox. Sure, I think so. Great. Okay. Thanks. Other announcements? I see that Margaret, uh, that her sister and brother-in-law have recovered from COVID. Oh. So that's a blessing that uh, we, should, we should give thanks for. Other announcements? Kathy, is your hand up? Or are you petting the animal? You have to unmute. You have to unmute yourself. <laughs> uh, did you put Bible study in the announcements? I did not. Okay. Um, I had sent something at some point. Um, the study of John, uh, the Gospel of John, will begin on the Wednesday, uh, the Thursday. Uh, the Friday Start again. Gospel of John begins on the Friday after Thanksgiving. Uh, <clears throat> it's going to be a, a, a good study. The Gospel of John is lovely for rough times. And I encourage you, if you haven't tried Bible study, this might be a good chance to give it a try. So if you've got any questions, just email me. Uh, it would be helpful if I know 
if you're intending to give it a try because I will have some documents to send out to people before it begins. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your and announcement. <laughs> Louise? Yes. Were you going to say something? Uh, Andrew and Lisa apparently have recovered. Andrew has gone back to work. Uh, they had COVID-19. Lisa had it much worse. And uh, I'm still keeping my fingers crossed. Okay, wonderful. Andrew, if you know, is Le Louise and David's son and daughter. Lisa is her daughter-in-law. Any other uh, offerings of gratitude or appreciation or the best thing that happened for you this past week? Oh, yes. Well, I'm celebrating my sister's 70th birthday this weekend, which is kind of fun. I'm in New Jersey. Um, when I got here, Elizabeth, my daughter Elizabeth sent me a message saying, don't freak out, but I've got a fever of 102 and a bad <laughs> headache. But the fever seems to be gone from what I can get information. But, um, She's still not feeling well, but she seems to be getting better. I'm very grateful for that. So, okay. yeah. uh, we're going to keep Kevin's sister in our prayers who has COVID. Kevin, what is your sister's first name? Uh, Kay. Kay. Okay, let's keep Kay in our prayers who has COVID. Also, it's good to see Lori Ayler's name down at the bottom. I assume that means that Lori is with us. I am. From, yes, I'm from with you. Yeah, all the way from Virginia. So we've got somebody from New Jersey and Virginia joining us today. So that's fun. All right. Anything else right now? Stick around after the service. We're going to um, have some conversation about outreach in our community and we'd like to get your input on that. So if you can stay, that would be helpful. Dear friends, the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of God's son, Jesus Christ, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and those you love this day and forever. Amen. Our closing hymn is Mine Eyes Have Seen the Glory. i
forth now into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor everyone. And love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Okay, folks, I'm going to stop us on Facebook and then we'll unmute everybody.